Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 12th Hall of Fame induction here at the Appalachian Trail Museum. Glad you all came out today on a suboptimal <laughs> uh, rainy day, but thankful for this pavilion. So thanks, everybody, for showing up. My name is Hawk Matheny. I serve as the Vice President of Trail Management with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And I'm honored and pleased to be here today to uh, perform the induction of the Hall of Fame next inductees. So um, really appreciate the invitation, Jim, to share this experience with you all. I just wanted to take a minute here to put some context around the Hall of Fame induction. And you know, this is a special day in the long history of the Appalachian Trail. While the trail is an internationally renowned scenic trail and provides an outstanding recreational experience, it is also a series of interconnected stories. Stories about the people who have made it happen. These are stories about folks who have made major and lasting contributions through dedication, commitment, perseverance, grace, and humor. While the list of folks who have made these types of contributions is long, and the meaningful work that has been done on the Appalachian Trail and the experience it provides, we have the privilege today of recognizing just a few individuals who have made these types of contributions throughout their careers and their lives. These are folks who have worked relentlessly towards supporting the trail aligning their life energy towards something that matters to them, both personally and professionally, and through a remarkable shared cause. The AT would not continue to exist over these past 100 years and into the future without the volunteers and professionals who have made it happen. Through this gift of their life's work, towards this much treasured resource, they are all deserving of this recognition today into the induction of the Appalachian Trail Hall of Fame. So now I'd like to take a few minutes to just recognize a few folks who have made this possible today and some prior inductees before we start the program for this year's class. Um, so first we have Julie Queen for the Appalachian Trail Museum Manager, is she here? Okay, you can recognize Julie. <laughs> and then all of the directors with the Appalachian Trail Museum Board, could you please stand for us? Okay, very good. And then within that, we have the Hall of Fame Committee, those who receive the nominations and make the selections for each year's class. Headed up by Jim. Very good. Thank you all for your contributions. And is Missy Shank here, the innkeeper at, Iron, at the Iron Masters Hostel? Is she here? No? Okay. Um, so now we have a number of folks who in prior years have received uh, Hall of Fame recognition. Uh, all, all present, I believe. Uh, Chris Bruton, over here in the corner. There's Chris. <laughs> and Warren Doyle. There's Warren, okay. Bob Peoples, hey Bob. And Pam Underhill, hey Pam. Anyone else here who's uh, been inducted that we didn't recognize so far? Larry? Of course, Larry back there, Larry Luxembourg, yes. Great. Very good. So that's uh, quite timely, because my next uh, responsibility here is to introduce Larry. So, <laughs> uh, so Larry's going to come up and share some remarks with us. Uh, thanks, Hawk. And um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge Jim Foster. Uh, Jim came up with the idea of the Hall of Fame and has been running it uh, ever since uh, our first uh, year in 2011 uh, and has uh, done a great job with it. So, so let's have some uh, applause for Jim. 
and uh, one Hall of Fame inductee who, who isn't with us today, uh, uh, Maurice Forrester passed away the, this uh, summer, and uh, some of his family is, is here today. They're going to have a recognition ceremony. But I, I wanted to mention, uh, particularly about Maurice, we, the museum wouldn't be in the park if, if it wasn't for Maurice. Um, in the early years, uh, he and I toured the old mill building, and I really liked the building. But this, it was a January day, it was very cold, very remote here. And I, after we, we uh, went through the building, I turned to Maurice and, and I said, you know, it's a really nice building, it's too bad it's here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, M Maurice, um, was, was terse, but put a lot of thought into every word. So he just said, why? <laughs> and, and he got me thinking. And, you know, he, he always got me thinking, and he, he was all, always helpful. And, and so we, 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 you know, took the idea of the, the building seriously and eventually located the museum here. And then ab about uh, two years later, we were in a meeting with the park and some other officials from DCNR, uh, and they were considering whether to give us a lease for the building. And here I was, a big city slicker from New York. They they didn't realize I was from Western Pennsylvania originally, and they were they were a little nervous about me and the the organization. We had no money, we had nothing, and anyway, um, Maurice was with me, and and Maurice was well known to all the DCNR officials, and and he vouched for me. So so th <laughs> so that enabled us uh, to 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 get the lease here. Um, so so we're we're very much in, in Maurice's debt for that. Um, just the, the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, briefly today, we've had a tradition since that first uh, year of induction in 2011 of also presenting a, a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for somebody um, oftentimes part of the museum family, but, but somebody uh, who's made you know, a, a big contribution to the AT over the years. Um, and this year, it's, it's my honor to present it um, to, to my good friend, Noel de Cavalcante. Um, Noel couldn't be with us today, but he had a unique contribution um, to the AT Museum for sure, but also to uh, ATC and, and to ALDA. Uh, after he did his uh, through hike in 1989, um, Actually, the only work he did for the rest of his life, he spent a year uh, at ATC, and, and he um, analyzed safety issues on, on the AT and started the Ridge Runner program, which has been very successful. And being the museum, we collected Knowles' uh, uniform, so we have the first Ridge Runner uniform in our collection. But in addition to that, he's had leadership positions uh, with ALDA ever since. He served as ALDA coordinator and has been on the board many years and has been on the uh, uh, museum board since uh, we got started in, in 1998. So, so we feel it was richly deserved to present uh, him with the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, so thanks, Hawk. Thank you, Larry. I've, I've had uh, the pleasure of sharing uh, many all the gatherings with Noel. If you haven't met him, he's a real fun guy to get to know and real character. So congratulations to him. Uh, next, I'll be introducing Bill O'Brien here. Thanks, Hawk. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce uh, Warren Doyle. He was an inductee in the class of 2020. But because of uh, COVID, we um, didn't have a banquet per se. Uh, since then, we did a thing like this last year, uh, almost in the dead of winter. <laughs> so thank you for doing it in October this year. But uh, um, he's going to come up and uh, formally receive his uh, uh, hiking stick and certificate. I just want to say earlier today, he gave a little talk where he among the uh, many other things he, he said, he's, he, he kind of talked about, um, you know, being an, uh, an ob observer at peace and how he didn't really think he could change anything. Well, he's dead wrong because you're looking at one of the things he's changed. 
at my, during the course of my first through hike in 1989, I hitchhiked to the gathering after hearing about it with an illegally placed flyer at Cloud Pond Lean To. <laughs> and um, that's where I first encountered the phenomenon of Warren Doyle. And um, it's funny, I, years later, I went back to look at my journal from that hike. And I had written in my journal every night <clears throat> until the gathering. When I got back to the trail after the gathering to continue southward, I never wrote in my, in my journal again. And I kind of wondered why that was. And I think the reason was <clears throat> I, I just didn't feel alone out there anymore because every night I was by myself in these shelters. And I, I gained a, a new family you know, I, I never knew I had a, a trail family. And it was, it's, you know, all because of this man, Warren Doyle. So come on up. <clears throat> he, um, there are a lot of titles you can attach to people. The one I, I value the most is, is teacher. And uh, th this guy is like the premier teacher of the Appalachian Trail. He has inspired a lot of people I hate to use the word countless, because I was a math major when I began <laughs> school. <laughs> but he has inspired countless people to successfully complete the Appalachian Trail long before there was an internet. So Warren, come on up. Here's your stick. <laughs> I'll try not to speak softly but I will. Um, it's one of gratitude. Uh, the Appalachian Trail is a 2,194 mile of slender, simple freedom. And everything I've given to the Appalachian Trail, it always gives me back more. And thank you say, for saying the word teacher I will have to say there is a place for educators along this lengthy pilgrimage route. And that was the role I felt I could best fill. But I will first and foremost want to thank all the volunteers through the decades, through the decades that have been out there with their paint cans and the paint brushes and their lopers year after year after year, season after season for keeping the trail continuously marked and free of uh, blowdowns. Uh, uh, I owe you a debt of gratitude for giving me a place to be free. Um, I want to thank uh, the Hall of Fame committee for nominating me, electing me. I, as I said before, it wasn't unanimous, I'm sure, unanimous, however, however you pronounce it. Uh, I want to thank my children, Heather and Forrest, for their dad's being away sometimes, uh, fulfilling his passion. Um, I want to thank Terry for being part of my uh, four finishes of the trail and being there and steadfast. Um, I certainly want to thank Bill O'Brien for, uh, if there's one person in all this history uh, in 40 years who's given the most of his heart and his uh, brain and his skill, it's uh, Bill O'Brien. So Bill, thank you for continuing this organization that we've felt so close to. And I also want to thank uh, Larry Luxenberg for uh, his uh, vision. Uh, and it's turned into a beautiful vision, Larry. And I'm glad you mentioned Noel, because Noel was in the first Appalachian Trail Institute in 1989 as well, along with Bill Irwin, the first uh, blind hiker to do the trail. So uh, I'm a people person, uh, and I love to see what happens to people when they interact with this wonderful pilgrimage route that goes right by here. And finally, I want to thank my dad, uh, Grampy, uh, who said, uh, <clears throat> you know, Warren, every day isn't a circus day. You know, Warren. Well, Grampy, wherever you are, AT Museum, thank you. This is the best kind of circus day I can think of. 
So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Larry, Bill, and Warren. And now I'd please introduce the uh, chair of the Hall of Fame nominee committee, Jim Foster. Bear with me a moment while I get stuff situated. We just realized that uh, we had not signed the uh, Hall of Fame certificate, so uh, Larry is doing that right now. <laughs> Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Jim Foster. It's my honor to be the uh, uh, chair of the Hall of Fame committee, and I want to thank you all for coming on this less than perfect day, but I think it's better than it was last year, so there is that. Uh, I want to especially thank my friend Hawk Matheny for uh, emceeing this year's introduction. Hawk and I have been friends for quite a while. I think we got to know each other when we each did presentations on the John Muir Trail uh, at an Alda gathering several years ago. Uh, Hawk is uh, recently promoted to Vice President of uh, Regional and Trail Operations at ATC and uh, very richly uh, rewarded excuse me, promotion in, uh, in my judgment. Um, we are here at uh, Pine Grove Furnace State Park, uh, and as Larry and maybe some other people uh, pointed out, uh, they're essentially our landlords, and we're incredibly grateful for, uh, for the state of Pennsylvania and the Department of uh, Conservation and Natural Resources for, uh, for housing us here. Um, just last Tuesday, the secretary of DCNR, my friend Cindy Dunn, invited me to uh, the announcement of uh, three new state parks in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, one of them is in York County, just a little way south of here. One of them is way up in Wyoming County. And the third one is right on the Mason-Dixon line. And it's the first time in a long time that Pennsylvania has added to its uh, state parks. I'm biased, and some of you are going to disagree, but I think Pennsylvania has the best state park system in the Commonwealth. Uh, some, some of you may, may want to promote your own state, but Pennsylvania is great. Um, Cindy did me the honor of introducing me to the governor on, on Tuesday. I walked up to him and said, Governor, I, I, uh, 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 to get a little political, I said, I, I worked a little on, on your campaigns and never had a chance to meet you. and. Uh, and Cindy started talking about the AT Museum and about some other stuff that I've done. And then someone said, uh, it's time for the hike, which I didn't know anything about. So the governor and I hiked about a mile together. And uh, uh, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, and we particularly talked about the Appalachian Trail Museum. And uh, I said, uh, Governor, if you ever want to tour the Appalachian Trail Museum, I know how to get in when the, when the place isn't open. Uh, so you and Francis ought to, ought to come. And the governor said he'd take me up on that, so we'll see if that happens. Uh, but uh, it was a delightful time, and uh, I was really glad to, just in a little uh, uh, way, get to know the governor. Uh, I'd like to welcome my friend Ron Tipton, uh, who is helping me give out the awards again this year. Come on up, Ron. Uh, Ron. Uh, was out hiking and uh, and fell and hurt himself a little bit, but he bravely has uh, agreed to come here and uh, and and uh, uh, help me out. Uh, Ron through hiked the AT in 1978. He spent his career as an advocate for public land preservation, national park uh, protection, and hiking trails. Uh, he became CEO of ATC in 2013, and he and he retired five years later. He's one of the founders of Alda and an important member of our Hall of Fame Selection Committee. And thank you for uh, coming here, especially in your injured state. <laughs> As Larry said, uh, we lost an important member of our Hall of Fame, uh, Maurice Forrester, this past year. And we all uh, 
uh, miss Maurice. I, I only knew him slightly, but uh, but we all all miss, miss uh, Maurice. I'm I'm also active in Keystone Trails Association, and Maurice was a very important part of Keystone Trails Association. The president of Keystone Trails Association, Katie Barker, is uh, is right here, and uh, thank you for making time, Katie, to uh, to be here. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to remind you that soon we'll be making plans for our 2023 uh, Hall of Fame class. In December, we will open our site for nominations. We've always designed this as uh, a, a process that, that uh, receives input from everybody involved with the trail in any way, and, and that means you. So please uh, give us your nominations. We already have a lot of nominations, but, but we can use more. Uh, and and, uh, and and if you nominate somebody who's already been nominated, that uh, tells us that uh, perhaps that person ought to be considered uh, for early induction into the Hall of Fame. Uh, we will announce the 2023 class in the spring, and our current plan is to have the 2023 induction sometime in the spring of 2023. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with COVID. We'll have to see about a lot of other things as to what kind of event we're going to have. But, uh, but we're definitely going to have an induction in 2023. Um, as Larry and some other people mentioned, we're happy to celebrate another solid year of progress at the museum. Uh, Julie Queen, our manager, is doing a great job. The interactive map display, which some of you probably saw this morning, is installed and it's partially operational. Uh, uh, soon it, it, it's going to be fully operational and if you weren't able to attend the grand opening this morning Gwen's going to lead another tour of the uh, of the museum at three o'clock and uh, including the interactive map um, I hope you will also get a chance to look at the Iron Masters mansion um, we took over operations of the mansion in 2020 which was not the best time to take over anything uh, <laughs> But uh, we, we kind of muddled through, and now we're, we're finally uh, sort of putting our imprint on, uh, on the Iron Masters. And those of you who uh, uh, were at Warren Doyle's talk and the interview with Lori Potiger saw one of the things we're doing, and that's the Hall of Fame room. The, there's one room within the Iron Masters that's going to be dedicated to the Hall of Fame. If you get a chance, take a look at it before you leave. And Andre Weltman, the chair of the Friends of uh, Pine Grove Furnace, is going to lead a tour of the Iron Masters. It's a really cool place. Dates back to the 1830s. Uh, it may have played a role in uh, in uh, the Underground Railroad, there's just an awful lot of cool uh, stuff about the Iron Masters if you like historic buildings like I do. Um, we also have a greatly enhanced website. Uh, and that is uh, uh, right there www.atmuseum.org. Joe Harold and myself uh, are the webmasters. Joe's doing a great job with that. Uh, you can help us with our plans for the future, like completing the Hall of Fame room. We encourage you to make a contribution to the uh, museum uh, building campaign if you have the financial resources to do so. Uh, this slide shows the criteria for the AT Hall of Fame. Um, and this year we're going to honor four individuals with induction into the Hall of Fame, uh, our 2022 class. Uh, we like to uh, have a, a combination of pioneers who, who uh, were involved in the early days of the trail and also uh, people who came along later on and played important roles in the AT. And I, I think this, uh, this, role, uh, this, this year's class is an example of that. Uh, this is the stick. Where's Bodacious? Is he is he here? Uh, uh, we're we're thrilled that Bodacious is with us. Uh, uh, John Bodet uh, traveled all the way up from Tennessee. He carves the sticks for us. They're one of a kind things. And if you take a look at the uh, Hall of Fame room, you'll see uh, every year Bodacious does a class stick, and we keep those in the uh, in the Hall of Fame room, and and there's something to look at. And and we also have one stick that you can. Uh, that, that is attached securely so that it doesn't walk away so that so that you can uh, take a picture of yourself with uh, with one of the Hall of Fame sticks so we have we have that as as well and uh, 
And that is, yeah, right, right, yeah, for $10,000, no, no, there's no donation. Uh, and that is uh, Bodacious' uh, shining face there. Uh, we also give honorees a uh, certificate. That happens to be the certificate for Bob Peoples, who uh, we're thrilled is also here uh, with us today. Uh, Bob was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2019, I believe. Uh, it, okay. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, it says 18 right on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, <laughs> uh, Margie Schmidt, who was our first uh, museum manager and is a graphic designer, has designed these, uh, these certificates. So our uh, 2022 class, I'm going to announce the uh, honorees in alphabetical order. Uh, Since the AT was laid out in the 1920s, uh, famously led by Hall of Famer Myron Avery and others, there have been many relocations of the trail. A couple of the best known are moving the southern terminus from Mount Oglethorpe to uh, Springer Mountain and uh, moving the trail from a road walk to a true trail in the Cumberland Valley of Pennsylvania, the, the, uh, where the, the club were uh, managed by the, the club where I happen to be a former president. I believe the biggest contiguous relocation of all time occurred in the early 1950s. As this slide shows, the original Myron Avery Trail went from Damascus, Virginia, then eastbound close to the Virginia-North Carolina border, briefly going into North Carolina, then gradually turning north towards Roanoke. That trail did have some attractive aspects like the uh, Pinnacles of Dan area. But there was a lot of road walk, and these roads were quickly becoming paved. The Blue Ridge Parkway was also being constructed on a path very close to the original trail. Meanwhile, to the north and west, toward the border with West Virginia, the Jefferson National Forest had been created. Starting around 1950, members of the Roanoke Appalachian Trail Club began to advocate for a relocation of the trail up towards the West Virginia border through the Jefferson National Forest. We understand that it was not easy to convince Myron Avery to agree to the reroute. We understand it wasn't easy to convince Myron Avery of much of anything, from what I understand. Uh, this movement and the construction of the relocated trail was led by our first inductees, Jim and Molly Denton. Jim Denton scouted a new path within the National Forest and supervised the construction of the rerouted trail by the Roanoke Appalachian Trail Club. While Jim would lead trail relocation efforts and coordination with the ATC, Molly participated in relocation crews and was a leader in the photography, entertainment, publishing, and fundraising committees. She would also be the first woman to serve as RATC president. After the reroute was completed, the Dentons moved north in Virginia and spent many years in the leadership of the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club. The Jim and Molly Denton shelter on the AT east of Fort Royal, Front Royal I should say, is named for them. And that's the Jim and Molly Denton shelter with uh, Jim Denton in front of it. I believe that was taken shortly before his death. Family was also an important part of the Dentons' lives. Their children, Jimmy, Shirley, and Michael, literally grew up on the trail, both hiking and on work trips. This is Molly with her three children in 1961. By the way, we thank Shirley for uh, these wonderful pictures. Um, and speaking of Shirley, that is Jim and baby Shirley in 1950. <laughs> um, after long and fruitful lives, Molly passed away in 1991 and Jim in 1995. We're thrilled that two of their children, Shirley and Michael, have traveled a long distance to be with us today. Please come up and get your stick on behalf of your parents and say a few words. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, 
This needs to be put back together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, um, can everybody hear me? Um, thanks for the recognition you just gave. Uh, I often have told this to friends of mine that I was raised on the Appalachian Trail, you know, and we were out there on the on the on the work crews, and particularly once my parents moved up to Northern Virginia, uh, in all the events that my parents coordinated, led hikes and such as that. Wasn't always on the AT, it might have been in West Virginia, but they were very involved in doing that. Um, I, the, the relocation of the trail, the two big ones that my father was involved in, the one that was brought up, the other one that didn't come to be, which was the Big Blue. They scouted it and it was built and it's, and it's still a trail as far as I know. Um, that was perhaps the biggest legacy they left. And you will hear my father mentioned as the, the, the primary driving force in that. But don't forget that my mom was taking care of three kids. And she was out there as much as she could, but I'm sure my, I'm sure my sister was very demanding. Uh, <laughs> um, Sisters can get even. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just want to say one other thing that maybe will be an inspiration. Maybe it's just something I want to say, but um, that's the legacy my parents left to the trail. My parents left a legacy of stewardship of the outdoors to their three children. Uh, my brother, who unfortunately didn't make it here, he's planning on it. He lives in Oregon in the Cascades. He hikes all the time in Arizona, frequently not using a trail. Uh, he's all over the place. Uh, I live in the northern mountains of New Mexico. My wife and I love to hike, ski, do everything outside. Shirley didn't get the memo about the mountains. She lives in Florida. <laughs> But she is, she's a biologist, she is an advocate for the outdoors. That has now been passed on to the, my, my parents' five grandchildren, all of which are active outdoorsmen and uh, enthusiastic. So pass it on if you can. I don't think my parents intended to do that, but they did a really good job. <laughs> and thank you so much for this. Yeah, yeah, take that back for a moment. Thank you. Go ahead. I don't really think you need me to speak because my brother said it all. <laughs> but I just wanted to say my dad could not really conceive that anyone should be through hiking the AT. It wasn't what was in their minds at the time. I would say that they not only walked pretty much all of the interesting parts of the AT, many of the less interesting parts of the AT, but they brought their kids to, I think, almost all of the interesting parts of the AT. <laughs> so in our family, I think we could say we've covered most of it. And another legacy that is out there to them is we have a cousin who has walked the entire AT. So <laughs> thank you all. By the way, Mr. Denton mentioned the Big Blue. For those of you who don't know, that's the Tuscarora Trail. It's an excellent trail. Uh, starts in uh, Pennsylvania, right uh, uh, at the uh, intersection of the uh, of the AT uh, near the Darlington Shelter, and, and the Darlington Shelter, the Darlington Trail goes the other way. Goes all the way down to the West Virginia border. It's a wonderful trail. I've I've only hiked. Uh, Oh, probably 30, 40 miles of it, but it's a wonderful trail and it's still getting a lot of use. Oh. Decades after the AT was routed through the Hudson Valley, uh, north of New York City, Development threatened the trail in its surrounding area. Later on in 1993, the private owners of a large forested parcel called Sterling Forest threatened to build a city for 35,000 inhabitants and 20,000 workers, a complex that would dwarf all but a few towns between New York City and Albany. Our next honorees, Joanne and Paul Dolan, 
spearheaded an effort to acquire the Sterling Forest property and save it from intensive proposed development by forming a public-private partnership to coordinate the efforts of what grew to be over 30 organizations, including the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Their long efforts culminated in the formation of the 22,000-acre Sterling Forest State Park in one of the nation's most densely populated areas. It is a rugged woodland just 40 miles northwest of New York City that is studded with crystalline lakes and streams and is a habitat for bobcat and black bears. As a result of the Dolan's efforts, this portion of the AT close to New York City is permanently protected from development. Joanne has been active in the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, including spending 15 years as its executive director. Paul spent a long career as a senior executive of ABC News. The Dolans received the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference's highest honor, the Raymond Torrey Award, in 2010. You may remember that Mr. Torrey was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2015. The Dolans plan to be with us today but they asked to be excused due to a family emergency, so we're pleased that Ron Rosen, who's a very important member of the New York-New Jersey Trail Conference, is here to accept on behalf of the Dolans. Thank you very much. Uh, I Actually, I think you pretty much said it all about their contributions. I know Joanne back from 1980 when she took over as the executive director of the Trail Conference. Uh, back then, the Trail Conference had one paid staff person, namely Joanne, for most of that time. Uh, some of it they picked up a second, not like now where it has a staff rivaling the size of ATC's staff. But... Uh, it's, it was then that the office was in 232 Madison Avenue in New York City and consisted of literally one and a half rooms. So it was a very small operation, but I got to know Joanne very well because that was about the same time I got involved with running the Appalachian Trail uh, Management Committee on the east side of the Hudson River in New York. So. I really got to know them well then, got to know Paul a little later, and were really impressed with their efforts after they got started on getting all the approvals for Sterling Forest. It was nearly 20 years before the creation of the state park, so they stayed with it the entire time, got other pieces of land near there protected as well, and it was a really great operation. So thanks to them, we'll pass it on to them when when, when I get back down to New York. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Ron, for stepping in for them. Uh, Ron did it on almost no notice, so uh, appreciate his eloquence on such short notice. Uh, We are glad to welcome our next honoree back to a place that she knows very well. Lori Pottinger threw hike the AT in 1987 using the trail name Mountain Laurel. That's a much younger Lori Pottinger, but she still <laughs> looks great today. Uh, after that, she became volunteering. Uh, she began volunteering with ATC in Harpers Ferry, and soon was hired there. Sometime later, Lori's mentor, Jean Cashin, announced her retirement as information services manager. Lori applied for the job and soon became Jean's worthy successor, the ambassador of ATC to thousands of visitors, including countless through hikers at ATC's headquarters. You may remember, those of you who uh, came to the uh, last banquet, that uh, uh, when we uh, inducted Jean Cashin into the Hall of Fame. Lori says one of her earliest experiences working for ATC was being interviewed by a writer named Bill Bryson. Two years later, Bryson, uh, already an internationally recognized best-selling author, wrote A Walk in the Woods. 
Rediscovering America on the Appalachian Trail. That book, later made into a movie, led to a huge influx of would-be hikers seeking to replicate the exploits of Bill and Katz. Beyond her role in a Harper's Ferry, Lori has been a supporter of the Appalachian Long Distance Hikers Association, known as ALDA, and is a relentless advocate for leave no trace principles. Lori can often be found wielding her plastic trowel and asking all backpackers to use it for, well, you know. In all seriousness, Lori says becoming a leave no trace master educator led her to seek out ways to reduce the impacts on the environment resulting from thousands of prospective through hikers all starting a northbound through hike at the same time from Springer Mountain. This led to the Flip Flop Festival, an event held in Harper's Ferry every spring designed to encourage long distance hikers to begin their hikes at various places along the trail rather than all at the same place. Now at least hundreds of hikers choose to start their through hike adventure at places like Harper's Ferry or Pine Grove Furnace, resulting in less stress on the AT infrastructure. Earlier today, when I was interviewing Lori, I said that uh, we've noticed here at the uh, Iron Masters and at Pine Grove Furnace a significant increase in the number of flip-floppers, which is excellent because it really cuts down on the stress in the months of, uh, of March and April down at, uh, in the Springer Mountain area and just north of Springer. Since retiring from ATC in 2021, Lori and her husband Dick have continued to maintain a section of the AT for the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club. She's also a certified AT chainsawyer, as you can see from this photo. Uh, Brian King is known as one of the AT's best historians. He worked for ATC for decades before retiring earlier this year. Brian would like to say a few words about Lori. So Brian, please come up. Hey, thank you, thank you, Jim. I did want to, uh, you know, say a few words in helping to honor Lori today. Um, not as a member of the selection committee, but because <laughs> she and I have had a, each other's backs for a third of a century, and I really am forever grateful for the chance, for the opportunities of working together with her. Early, you know, as Jim mentioned, early in '96, when Gene Cashin decided to retire. I had the opportunity to make a lot of changes in, at ATC in the sales, fulfillment, and information services areas. And back in those in pre-internet days, Lori was the voice on the other end of the phone upstairs when you called to order books or maps or other things. If you were planning a hike, she did more than take some of your money. She, she asked about your experiences and then gave you some advice and ponies and references from her own which were considerable. We did have a strict hiring process then, and others, including a couple friends of hers, had applied, but the interviews and references all led to Lori uh, going downstairs. I had expectations, of course, uh, but I don't remember having any idea at the time how she would grow and reorganize the volunteer-centered visitor centers, and importantly, weave together the strands of hiking trail maintenance, corridor monitoring, LNT fanatic, management policies, trail history, and the needs and values of both, first the trail and second the ATC. That weaving together went into all our interactions with the various publics drawn to both. And that's where fo focus always remained, when the needs of both the curious and the committed, with trail protection never far from her thoughts. And I can think of no one else in the recent history of the ATC staff, sorry, Ron, uh, who managed to pull together all those threads into the same fabric to try to stay on top of what was going on in all areas of ATC's work. No one else from what might be called the office side of the organization, for example, went to as many conservation and trail work meetings as she did. Uh, that commitment to what other people wanted and needed continued as information services went more digital. She pulled her talents with others to deliver the same messages, just not so much in person, where her smile is so well known among you. We went through a lot together, a lot of changes, six different administrations and organizational structures, 
I, and I recently had a distinct, distinct pain of going through tons of paper from those days and being reminded of so many good things I had forgotten about and won't go into now. We also went through five dark events on the trail, starting on our second or third month on the job, which I could not have gotten through without Lori right there. With the best contacts and the most perceptive ideas for the public side of things, while the media side was being dealt with. And as Jim mentioned, we shouldn't forget a lot of festivals she dreamed up or organized, including Flip Flop. A lot of nominations for the Hall of Fame like to use the words dedication and passion. Often it applies as it does here. But in Lori's case, aside from 65 hour work weeks and sneaking back in the office late at night from the very start, I like to think it was simply Lori being Lori, knowing what was right for the trail and then doing the right thing. Lori's not fond of this kind of recognition. This is gonna cost me a couple of fine beverages. <laughs> um, so let's think of it as just a world, well-deserved thank you as a simply a birth, birthday wish a day early. Come on up, Lori. <laughs> Can I just cry for three minutes now? <laughs> Come around this way, please. <laughs> What am I doing here? Uh, you're, you're coming, just come around here. We wouldn't want you to trip on your induction day. <laughs> yeah, just right over here. So um, I've been lauded for a few things. Um, one of the things that I probably hear most often is that you're a really good listener. <laughs> what I don't hear is, Lori, you're, you're a great speech writer. Lori, you're a great speech delivery person. Except by accident, if anyone is here that remembers a, a certain um, speech at an all the gathering um, that ended up be unintentionally being x-rated by me. <laughs> I was trying to make um, corridor monitoring sexy, but I didn't really intend to go that far. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I asked Dick if I could tell this joke, and he said no. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for this, um, and uh, also these um, incredibly. Um, um, amazing speakers in this audience, um, legendary speakers, ex wonderfully ex then ex somebody help me out. Ex <laughs> yeah, those kind of speakers. <laughs> that I am not. So I'm going to go to my notes now. So um, thank you for this um, incredibly meaningful honor. I am flabbergasted. Um, my mom, my dad, um, my twin brother Bruce Peel would be so proud. Um, the success of Larry's vision illustrates two things about the AT that I, I passionately believed in during my time at ATC. One is the power of dreams, and we heard this theme from uh, Warren this morning, but I believe in them too. It's, it's a wonderfully American trait. And of course, our first uh, dreamer was Bent Mackay, and look where we are 100 years later after it all just started as a dream. Uh, there are millions of hikers who have the dream of hiking the AT, whether it's two miles or 2,000, and it all just starts as a dream. And then we have our visionaries who look for how to make the AT even better. Um, and we're in the era these days of land protection. So we have someone like um, coming from the Forest Service, Tom Speaks, who couldn't be here today, but um, has enhanced the AT um, landscape greatly um, in the corridor through his tenure. From the club side, um, Joanne and Paul Dolan um, 
Uh, and I can speak to the difference in the trail in New York um, from 1987 and when I was there on my section hike maybe five or ten years ago. It was just, um, you know, incredible the, the difference between the kind of honestly icky roadwalks and then beautiful, you know, forests and lakes and just being immersed in nature, you know, and in quiet. Um, at ATC, visionaries like um, Hawk and Karen Lutz that have helped to preserve and um, protect those beautiful landscapes, you know, that, you know, we walk a footpath, but it's those views and it's the quietness that uh, inspire us and keep us, you know, on that linear footpath. Um, on the NPS side, um, Pam Underhill, who's here today, um, I mean, you know, that that's uh, a whole day you could talk about Pam's um, contributions to the footpath, the corridor, and um, the landscape. So these are people who all say, you know, they, they have a vision and they have a dream and they say, um, we can find innovative ways to work with people to protect this land for future generations. And of course, um, you know, the ultimate dreamer, there's no better example than Larry Luxenberg. And, you know, I was there when he, first talked about where where is he still you know I it was just uh, this, this little idea in his head this vision a dream of an AT museum and I mean my god look at it now and um, Jim and his idea of the Hall of Fame and how well established and beautiful that's become so um, I also want to say um, an element of the uh, Larry's dream and the um, the AT itself, of course, is the role of volunteers, and you know there'd be no AT museum without them, just as there would be no AT. Uh, and anything that I was able to accomplish at ATC uh, couldn't have been done without volunteers. Um, quite a few who are in the audience, and uh, it's their passion and dedication and ideas that inspired me and help me achieve anything that I was successful at. And so finally, there are a few people I'd like to give special credit to for my career at ATC. Uh, my father, Wilfred Peel, who was a trail maintainer for the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club and gave me a love of the outdoors. Uh, Jean Cashin, my predecessor at ATC, who you've already heard about and many of you knew, uh, who was my model. Often when I was in a really tough situation, I would ask myself, what would Jean do? <laughs> Brian King, who was uh, my mentor, my history teacher, and steadfast supporter at ATC, and eloquent uh, speechwriter. <laughs> and last of all, um, Dick Potteriger, my husband, who enabled me to give my all, um, as Hawk said, align my life's energy to the AT, and he did that by doing the uh, lion's share of work at home and on the trail and supporting me in all of my AT endeavors. Thank you. As uh, people who know me uh, uh, will say, uh, I, I have a lot of ideas, and every once in a while I come up with a good idea. Uh, <laughs> one example of the good idea that I came up with is the AT Hall of Fame, and, and I have to say that uh, there have been three presentations that have really moved me. Uh, one of them was uh, being able to induct Larry Luxembourg. Another one was to induct my good late friend uh, Tom Johnson, and this is the third one to be able to induct uh, Lori. So uh, uh, it's well-deserved, Lori, and, and uh, thank you for all your work. Okay. Since we founded the Hall of Fame in 2011, We've honored folks in several categories associated with the AT. This includes those who conceived of the trail, 
like Benton Mackay, those who got it built, like Myron Avery, those whose work sustained it over the years, uh, like some of the people gathered here, uh, Chris Bruton, among others, uh, and those who've made their mark hiking the trail, uh, Warren Doyle, uh, and others, and, and those who've encouraged and supported others, like Bob Peoples, for example. Uh, we've also honored some important figures with our primary federal partner, the National Park Service. But we've never honored anybody from our federal or state landowner agencies. We're finally filling that gap today. Tom Speaks played an important role uh, in leadership uh, for the Forest Service in a achieving critical land acquisitions in the South. Tom began his career with the U.S. Forest Service as an AT Ridge Runner. During his 35-year career, he served in a variety of roles which allowed him to negotiate and advocate for permanent protection of the AT as both a negotiator in the 1980s and the first leader of the Forest Service's AT land acquisition team in the 1990s, Tom was successful in acquisition of numerous parcels of land connecting the AT through its southernmost sections in Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. These acquisitions included Rocky Fork, Spy Rock, Max Patch, and the Rhone Highlands. Tom also served as a legislative assistant for the chairman of the House Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, using that time to ensure AT community issues were emphasized on Capitol Hill. As forest supervisor for the Cherokee National Forest in Tennessee and the George Washington Jefferson National Forest in Virginia from 2004 to 2015, Tom kept protection of the AT as a top priority by securing protection of several remaining significant AT tracks, including the 10,000 acre Rocky Fork property in Tennessee and the Selenese Crossing in Virginia. An example of Tom's persuasive and relentless effort is Rocky Fork near Unicoi, a 10,000 acre tract that hosts about eight miles of the AT. The Forest Service contacted the uh, landowners who were initially resistant. Tom met with one influential landowner and helped him bale hay for a day. This eventually led to a meeting in his living room and the man agreed to sell the top of his property to the Forest Service. After that, all but one adjoining owner agreed to sell. I grew up in the country and I baled hay and uh, if you've never baled hay, you have no idea what work really is. Uh, after a long career, Tom retired from the Forest Service in 2016. Ron Tipton was instrumental in bringing Tom to the attention of the rest of us on the Hall of Fame Committee. Ron, uh, we'd like you to do double duty today. Um, Tom was going to come and his wife was coming too. Unfortunately, they were uh, tested positive for COVID a few days ago and decided that it was best for them not to come. So we certainly understand uh, what, while, uh, what, why they uh, are unable to be with us today. Uh, Ron, so if you would uh, say a few words for Tom and also accept uh, his hiking stick and award. Thank you. Well, it'll, well it's great to, great to see all my friends and colleagues from the Appalachian Trail community. Um, a month, a month ago tomorrow, I was hiking in Northern California near the Pacific Crest Trail and um, took, a, took a downhill step on a very hot and, and baked piece of earth and down I went. And that's why I'm standing up here limping. One of my first thoughts was that, oh no, I'm going to miss the Appalachian Trail Museum Hall of Fame event. <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to my lovely wife, Rita, and, and our, our precocious dog, Julie. Um, so I knew Tom well, and I did advocate strongly for him as a part of the, um, of the uh, selection committee. And I just want to make a few comments about Tom and actually pass on comments that Tom gave me to deliver to you today. Um, uh, the story you told um, uh, Jim, about 
um, his landowner relationships was so typical of Tom. He figured out a way to get it done. Um, that guy that was that he helped bail hay was pretty strongly against ever having his land go into federal ownership. Um, Tom gave me some comments, which um, uh, I heard about his um, COVID situation the same day I think that Jim did. And um, here's what he said for me to say to you. I have at least a hundred anecdotal stories of how much my family has enjoyed the fruits of the AT through the years. From my son's first overnight camp out on the trail with me when he was about nine, to his return from a tour in Afghanistan when I picked him up at the airport and he said, let's head to Roan Mountain and spend the night. <laughs> and my daughter, who's a Roanoke AT club member who loves to remind me of the grueling AT hikes I would take her on, and of course she now leads me on. <laughs> Not to mention the amount of time my lab spend with me on trail. I was just fortunate to have a job and team that worked with me and that facilitated such positive experiences. And I know there are so many others that have millions of positive memories from the trail. Now, Jim touched upon a very important point. Um, as great as our um, 40, what's it, 44 now? Um, on our, uh, inductees, as great a group as we have, we've given the Forest Service short shrift. And I'm so glad to have the, the time to be here today to speak on behalf of Tom Speaks, who did as much as or as more for anyone in the U.S. Forest Service, along with Dave Sherman in his days at, with the Forest Service, to protect this trail and its larger landscape. Um, finally, um, I would also mention that um, when I was the head of ATC, we had a ceremony uh, in Roanoke uh, to, uh, to congratulate Tom on his retirement in 2014. My good friend Dave Sherman gave me some comments that he had sent along for that event. Um, and I'll read those. Tom Speaks, in recognition of his 35 years of outstanding leadership, consistently demonstrated management accomplishments, effective political abilities, and he was that, and extraordinary achievements for the American public in acquiring and protecting lands for the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, in addition to some of the most significant natural treasures remaining in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, happened to be my favorite section of the trail, including the magnificent Rocky Fork Track in Tennessee. Tom has made great things happen that would never have happened without him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, thanks for us too. Uh, please tell uh, Tom thanks for us too. So this is the 2022 class of the Appalachian Hall of Fame. Uh, would all of the members and representatives of the uh, 2022 class come forward again and be recognized? Uh, uh, Ron, don't sit down. Everybody get their pictures? Okay. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Hawk. <laughs> all right. Well, very good. Thank you all for your um, attendance and participation at today's Hall of Fame induction event. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.